I'm John Cullen, a uh, retired jockey, uh, retired race course trainer, a uh, race horse trainer, I should say, and currently I'm a cameraman for Iris. So we had ponies when we were younger, and we used to, our neighbours up the road, the Murphys, we used to ride ponies together. And even though I always kind of knew, all, the only thing I ever wanted to be when I was younger was a jockey. Um, so just, I suppose, and the Murphys were into racing as well, and we just had great times together as younger, younger having the crack and, you know. Um, well, I'd done hurling football, um, boxing. Um, I suppose I was hurling with St. Peter's College in Wexford, I suppose. I suppose the most notable person I used to play beside was uh, Rory McCarthy back in the time. Um, then uh, football as well with the school and was a bit of the club as well. I used to hurl with Euler de Balak. Um, so, and then I used to box with the Balak Boxing Club. So I kind of was okay. I've done okay at the boxing when I was doing it. Um, I won one All Ireland doing it. Um, boxed twice for Ireland. Um, so it was good. It kept me fit, I suppose. So my uncle, I suppose, was a jockey, but I don't really remember him riding. Um, he he rode for Tom Costello. Um, he won an Irish National and I suppose other races now, but I just know he won the Irish National and he rode in the English National a few times as well. Um, so I, I don't know, it wasn't really him that kind of really wanted me to do it, be a jockey. It just, I suppose, I don't know what it was. I just, I suppose, enjoyed the jumping and the faster I go on, the better. When I done show jumping, it was more about getting the fastest time than having to clear round really more so to be honest with you and if the clear round came it came but it was all about having the fastest time i rode in a couple of pony races um i rode a shetland when i was about five or six i'd say in the pony race um don't really remember much of it and i, I rode a, a horse for our pony for my neighbors the murphy's up the road as well um so there wasn't much pony racing around my area back in the time um but i suppose it was mainly show jumping, so we kind of done a bit more of that and done a bit of hunting and hunter trials. And, you know, any time we used to ride the ponies at home, we used to go up and up to the Murphys and we'd all go off together and go down to the beach or go off jumping ditches and hedges. And we just had, we had great fun doing it, you know. So I've, uh, my mother and father and I've uh, one brother. Um, so like my parents, my, my parents used to bring me, you know, we used to do a good bit of show jumping. Um, I rode t uh, two years in the Dublin Horse Show. Um, one for uh, uh, Tomás Byrne, he owned the pony, and then our own pony, then uh, Conflict. Um, it, he, he rode him in a 13-2 class in a, you know. Um, so look at that, uh, we like, we went all up, well, there was a lot of gym cannas around our local area, but still we were brought, you know, to the, the Dublin, different the Dublin qualifiers in different uh, parts. Uh, so, you know, in fairness, they were on the road a lot, bringing us everywhere. Um, so, we had a we had a great, you know, great childhood as regards. We had a balance of everything, you know, balance of probably uh, ponies, uh, hurling, football, boxing. You know, like, you know, even though, like, for the year I actually won the All Ireland in boxing, uh, I used to only train for boxing once a week. Uh, but I was on, we'll say, the hurling team in school. I was on the football team in school. I was uh, on the athletic, on the athletics. And so, like, then there was, we used to have indoor soccer. So I used to be, at every lunch, be playing something. And then I was a board, boarder in uh, St. Peter's in Wexford at the time. And so every evening to be either training of some sort, if not to be indoor soccer, handball, to you know, I was always playing some kind of a sport. My first job was uh, for Tom Lacey in Offaly. Um, so I went up to him when I was, I think I was 16. Um, I'd finished my junior cert. And so I kind of, uh, I think uh, Jack, my uncle got me a job there. Um, so Pat Smullen was there, Stephen Cox was there at the time. Um, we had, we, and in fairness, Tom, Tom Lacey was very good to me too. Like, um, I had, he, we brought up my, one of my ponies and we went show jumping. He brought me show jumping a couple of times and, you know, we nearly had Pat Smullen turn into a jump jockey for a while when we were up there. He, he was doing a bit of jumping with the ponies as well back in the yard and we had, uh, we had great fun and 
Um, it was great, you know, you know, and every day we used to love uh, in Tom Lacey's every day we used to be brought in for the lunch and uh, Mrs Lacey, you know, she used to look after us very well. So, it was, you know, it was a great place to start. I got a job in Michael Harrigan's then. And uh, so I went down to Michael Harrigan's then and I spent a couple of years down there with Mike and Mike and in, in, uh, Patrick's well, where I met a good few characters, a good friend of mine, Aidan Fitzgerald down there as well, Scobie. Uh, we had we had great crack, even though we worked hard, and but we had it was probably I suppose nearly the best time in my life as regards crack. We you know we really enjoyed ourselves. We were all young and we all wanted to be jockeys, and you know we all edged one another on, and you know it was good fun. Timmy Murphy was there at the time. Shane Brodrick was there at the time. Scobie, uh, just was a few more. Uh, uh, Leo Temple. Uh, Paul Maloney, um, you know, we used to, I suppose, start early in the morning, there was, uh, there was four of us used to share a room, um, you know, the heating probably wouldn't have been great, we used to, sometimes used to go to bed in our clothes, um, but uh, we'd get up in the morning and go out and do the horses, uh, feed them, and we had, we used to have maybe six horses to look after, and, um, uh, then we'd uh, feed them and muck them out and ride them out and we'd have breakfast then. We'd come in and have breakfast then and halfway through the morning and then we'd work to probably lunchtime and ride out with a few more horses. And one thing about, I suppose, Mike's, to be always breakers, there'd be always things going on and when they'd be in the school with breakers, we'd be kind of trying, you know, to try and maybe get a little edge, we'd be all trying to sweep the yard kind of close where he might say, get your hat and get up in this lad. And so, you know, it was all, you know, a bit of competition was, it was great. And my first ride in the point point for Mike, um, at the horse, his nickname was Stretch. All the horses down there had nicknames. So, um, need to say, I uh, fell off it. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, you know, I, I had actually, you know, for, I, Borrowed Shane, Shane Broderick's uh, stone and a half saddle on the day and sure I got up on it then and sure I tried to let the stirrup letters down a bit and they were as long as they could go so I was riding two holes too short and he made, he made a little mistake around the second or third last and I fell off it, dude, fell off it so. So we were in the Harrigans, we used to go in for the breakfast and uh, look sure we, we didn't really have much money like wages were, were poor um, so we had to because I suppose going out was more important than feeding ourselves so we used to skimp on the food and, and go out and have the crack uh, so we used to go out maybe three or four nights a week on, on 80 pounds a week and feed ourselves as well and uh, so when you come in then uh, we said the frying pan would be on the, on the cooker and uh, there might be a few footprints on, on, the, on, the, on the fat that would be after drying there might be a few footprints on it so we just heat her up and away we go again a good friend of mine, Dennis Murphy, he gave me a few spins as well. Um, I don't know, my cousin was riding for him a bit as well, so if he had a few spares, he gave me through a few spares my way to get me, give me a bit of experience. And so I kind of nearly rode my first winner for him, but I went the wrong side of a bale, which I lost it in the steward's room. I went outside the bale instead of inside the bale, and uh, even though I went a longer course and we won the race, but we went off the track so I tried to never make that mistake mistake again. It was a learning good learning curve. So I had to wait for a year and, uh, and then the following season uh, it was in Kinsale the last meeting of the year. I ended up writing uh, two winners for Leonard Whitmore um, in, um, in Kinsale. Um, so it was a long time to wait and then Sure, the point-to-point -point season was over then. I didn't start back till January. So I had to wait the next, the next January. And kind of luckily, things picked up a bit. And, um, you know, I didn't have to... Point-to-point -point started going a bit better then for me. I suppose point-to-point -point was different then than it is now. Like, I suppose, racing was different then. If you wanted to get on and get rides in racing, you had to actually work in the yard. Like, you didn't just ride out. You had to actually work and do a full week's work. And the trainer would... You know, obviously he'd reward you if you thought you were good enough and if you thought you were putting into working hard enough. Um, like when we were in Mike's, he had, you know, he had 
five or six amateurs mad looking to write, get point to point rides and to get experience and we all wanted to be jockeys and some of us made it and so, some of us didn't like to know um but having said that like we we had great crack and um whereas if you're if the yard you're working in if he wasn't giving you rides you wouldn't have had a chance to get rides anywhere else because no one would have seen you and it's a place I learned how to, when you get start getting going, you get a few rides from Mike and it gives you more confidence and you learn how to, to ring up trainers and try, you know, to be your own agent because it's your, like, it's, if you want to do it, it's up to yourself if you want to do it. So, like, we used to ring up, um, you know, to get the feed, Irish field and, you know, if you saw people that you'd know, you'd, you'd eventually, you'd, some of them you wouldn't even know and you might just ring them on the off chance and you'd eventually get relationships with them like you know you kind of had to build up a you know a relationship with trainers like he mightn't even have a clue who you are and the next thing he might be at a point might and he might see you riding a winner so oh, that's the lad that rang me and just i might use him again if he rings again so you might ring again and you know and it's the same when we, when I eventually got going on the track then as well, got a few winners on the track. We used to, every morning, we used to ring up, um, I think it was the, the turf club at the time, see was there any spares in the bumper. And so you'd ring up and they'd say, well, such and such mightn't have, doesn't have a rider down. So you'd say, right, you'd have the, the paper and you'd take off the people that wouldn't. So you'd get the Irish field directory then and you'd be dialing up the numbers to try and get in quick, to try and get a ride, you know. Um, so it was just, that's how you learned, you learned how to, how to get rides for yourself. Oh, he, he, he likes everybody to call him Mike. You know, uh, I was there for two years. Um, at the time, Dave Watchman, he was, he was head man there. Um, you know, who, you know, you know, I ended up riding for him down the track as well when he went training himself as well. So uh, Dave, Dave, he was very stickler for the time, but he was, he was a great head man and, he, you know, I'd say he was a good trainer too, you know. Um, I left Mike's uh, to go to Sue Bramall. Uh, so I worked for Sue Bramall then for a couple of years. I uh, actually rode my first winner on the track for her, uh, Colonel George, um, um, in Leopardstown. Um, so like in fairness, she was a good supporter of me over the years as well. And uh, I was there for a couple of years and, you know, uh, made a few friends, Joe Gorman, um, you know, he, he taught us a, bit, a thing or two. He was a good rider as well um, back in the day and he, he was head man for, for Sue at the time. And so Joe used to, in fairness, he often, we often, he often brought me up for the dinner, you know, himself and his wife, Chris. So, um, you know, everywhere I went, I was lucky to find somebody that, you know, looked after me real well. Like, you know, I always found... You know, there's always, in fairness in racing, there's always loads of people, you know, that we always kind of look after one another, you know. When I was in Sue's, I was uh, point to point as well. And I was riding for uh, Dennis Murphy, Leonard Whitmore, uh, Peter O'Rourke, um, kind of a lot of Wexford people. Like, I suppose point to points were different back then. There, were, there was, there weren't as, people had maybe 20 or 30 horses, not 80 four-year-olds. Um, like point to point, it was, it was different. It wasn't all about one race. It was, you know, all about, you know, there was six-year-old maidens, you know, they were as important as, as, as any, as any four-year-old or five-year-old, you know, there was still horses being sold for, out of the point of points. It was more relaxed than, um, than it is now. There's a lot of pressure now. There's a lot of money involved. Point of point riders, like there was Philip Fenton, uh, John Burry, John Thomas McNamara, um, Tony Martin, Warren Ewing, um, sort of was myself, uh, sort of Aidan Fitzgerald was riding at the time as well. Uh, used to love point to points he did. Um, you know, there was a lot of good riders back then. Where I suppose now it's kind of, well, you know, I suppose the last couple of years it was kind of either uh, Jamie, uh, Derek, or uh, Barry O'Neill. It's kind of like, they're the tree. If you couldn't have them, you kind of like say, who else would you have? Really, do you know? Um, I suppose I'm not really following it well enough to see if there's any good young lads coming up either. Uh, but uh, back then, I suppose 
Like, and it was a big time. John Thomas McNamara, he rode 50 winners in a season. It was like, where they are break 100 now, the season. You know, there's so many runners. Um, the, it, the, it's a longer season as well. It's, there's, you have an autumn campaign where it used to be only uh, uh, January to, to June. So I was, I suppose I spent uh, two years with Sue Bramall and then I kind of went to William Mullins's and um, uh, I suppose the, there was the time uh, Florida Pearl and Alexander Banquet, like, you know, it was kind of really the start, not probably was the start of William Mullins, but, you know, it was the start of, you know, Noel Mead was champion trainer all back then and Willie was hot on his heels and um, he had a few good horses back then and so it was, you know, there was, and there was a few amateurs there. Ruby had turned professional, and probably, I suppose, we felt that the, the door might be left open for a few amateurs. So it was myself and Kevin O'Ryan was there. Uh, Busty Ammond was there. Uh, Niall Ammond. Uh, um, I can't think of anyone else who was there now. Two minutes, if my, um, but it was, and I was still doing point to points back then, even though I was in Willies and I was an amateur in Willies and. Um, I was I kind of used to look after the the green barn at the time, um, so you know. And I rode I rode a few times for Willie, never rode a winner for him. Obviously, you know you'd nearly think a jackass would be able to ride a winner for Willie Mullins at the minute anyway. But I couldn't ride a winner for him anyway. Um, but uh, you know I was starting. To, I suppose we get more winners in the point of points as well. And I was you know I was starting to get a I, I was you know I had a goodish name at uh, point of points but I still hadn't ridden a winner on the track so uh, I probably I was riding six years before I rode my first winner on the track um, so um, but like you know luckily you know the point of points were keeping me going and when I went to Billy Mullins then I ended up uh, touching base with uh, Scobie and you know said I was going to Willie Mullins's and he said you know Willie was going to put me up somewhere uh, near his place and sir sort of Boris is only over the road and so Scobie said sure why don't you come and stay with us so I ended up going to Boris and living with Scobie and you know um, staying in Mrs Breen's and there again another mother figure to look after me so Mrs Breen used to feed us and you know she was very good to us as well and you know um, she you know you know she'd look after us really well and we're, you know, we're very lucky again to find someone to, to look after us well and you know we had you know a grand uh, warm house to come home to and you know sit down and have the chat on the couch and so it was uh, one particular time I suppose but I I don't know if people know but I, I never drank so I used to be always doing the driving so we went off down to Clamell or something you know for, for some kind of a night out or something anyway and so on the way home I don't know if many people know Scobie he, he's not good at holding his drink so when I got back to Boris the mid next thing I was pulling him out of the car he was fast asleep and he uh, he kind of got puked into the pocket of the car of the door so I said he's going to pay for this <laughs> so I went to work the next morning I left the sick there for the whole time and brought him. and so when I came home then at lunchtime he was on the couch dying so I went in and I grabbed him by the ear and said come out here you and uh, showed him what he had uh, he nearly puked again having to clean it out of the car I must have gave him 10 grand but he only paid me back three I'd say and that that, that DJ equipment was very expensive Asher he just used to, I wouldn't say he was any good he used to just play music like you know um, he and I'm sure he he loved it sure he you know he was uh he he had the gear anyway and he just played songs sure he sure he you know sure I don't think, I think anybody could play it was like having a CD player and just push and play on the, on the thing so my first winner on the track was uh it was an amateur hurdle in Leopardstown uh on a horse called Colonel George for Sue Bramall um you know he was you know actually it's amazing like he he had broke down before and the ground was good to firm and you know he actually broke down on soft ground and he won two races on good to firm after you know so sometimes you might be thinking that uh you know the quick ground you know sometimes if they're galloping on ground maybe that they don't like maybe that's what maybe broke him down you know but he loved he loved quick ground and uh 
you know, he, he, he won and he kind of got the thing ball rolling. I was six years riding before I even rode a win on the track. And when I rode a win, when I rode him, kind of winners started to come a little bit easier then and uh, things picked up. And um, so I, I rode, like in that month, I probably rode three winners, you know. Um, so I rode, I won on him again and, and I won on, I think it was classic referendum for Liam Brown. Um, and then uh, Leperstown again, an amateur uh, flat race. So, you know, it gave me more confidence because I always remember riding him. Um, the, the, they were after kicking, leaving the back straight. And I felt like, you know, that they were after kicking a bit soon. And I kind of, kind of took a few seconds just to take a breath. And luckily they came back to me and, and I won and won well. So it always remembers me that, you know, always knowing where the line is is the most important thing of anything, you know, because at the end of the day, it's the only place you're going to get paid is on the line, you know. Um, I think I was two years in Willie's and I think I met James Nolan. I think I was on holidays when I met James Nolan and I ended up going to ride out in Nolan's. And so I was an amateur in Nolan's when I started off and um, just things got running very quick in Nolan's. We got a few winners and um, so the next year, you know, I had, James and Paul said to me, would I be interested in turning professional? So I kind of said, geez, I would, you know, I didn't think, I suppose I was so long, so slow about getting going. I was probably 23 at this stage. And, you know, I was like, I'd, I was still a claimer, still a five pound claimer. And uh, like, so I said, I turned professional then. And I actually, luckily, things got, went well. And I was a uh, champion conditional that year. I think at 27 and 26, 27 winners, I think it was. Um, so that was, and just luckily, I, I kind of never looked back really then, you know. Um, just we had great years together and, you know, we came across a few good horses, uh, which is, a, you know, it's, and uh, I suppose not long after turning professional, I, I, I rode uh, the Tyess's winner and Bob Tracy, which he was kind of the kickstart to my career, you know. It's all about, you know, getting your name, you know, seeing, Riding big winners, it's kind of, you know, it gets everybody interested in you. Like, you know, p people see and, you know, it, it leads to more, you know. But the highest is, is full of tradition. Like, you know, back then, especially, like, there was nearly more Wexford people at the go to the days than probably even Kilkenny people. And that's it, you know, like, all, you know, loads of people from Wexford, from Blackwater, used to go to, go to the days. And, you know, they'd all stop in Burris on the way home as well, didn't, uh, you know, you know, on the way home and to have their own, you know, little pit stops on the way home. And, you know, it was a different time, like, you know, you know, everybody used to, uh, you know, stop off and, uh, you know, have a few drinks and have the crack and tip away home, you know. Yeah, Bob Tracy, like, just, he was a great horse, uh, great jumper, you know, he could go into the boards and still be quicker than horses winging the fences. He was just so economical and yet he could stand off the wings and, you know, take lengths out of, out of horses. He was, um, I think it was by over the river as far as I can remember. And uh, like a lot of, there were, there were a great jumping uh, sire, he, you know, they used to, very rarely you'd ride an over river that wouldn't jump well. Um, so Bob Tracy like was uh, like, and then uh, he won, he won the Thaises and then he came on and he won the Red Mills then the, the, the same year. He beat, uh, I think it was Nick Dundee of um, um, Edward O'Grady's the same year. Um, do you know, so, do you know, he was a great, great start to me. Um, do you know, it, it led on to bigger and better things, thank God, do you know, and I, I was thankful, thankful for, um, for the likes of um, Dennis Hickey and, do you know, Bob Tracy, like, because he really got me going. When I was in uh, Sue Bramble's, um, it's like that was my first introduction to Ken Whelan. Uh, he was he used to ride for in England and he was back around Ireland and he was point pointing and as well and I think he turned professional around that time, you know. So he he uh, so one day we were going from uh, Sue's to which is in Gory to Wexford and it was Ken's first time in the car with me. And so he was in the passenger side and I was uh, driving and so I don't know, people know that I'm deaf as a boot in my left ear. So when he'd be talking to me, I'd be doing this to him to, to hear what he's saying. And he wasn't very happy with the fact that I was taking my eyes off the road. So he got out of the front seat 
and got in behind me in the back and says, you keep your eyes on the road and I'll keep talking to you. You know, winners were coming kind of well and Paul's, Paul's was going well at the time. Like, to be honest, of all, like, they were the fittest horses, like, you know, I'd say probably to this day nearly I've ever ridden like back then. Like, he, they were just, like, even the moderate horses, they, they never stopped galloping. You know, they were unbelievable. And James and Paul, like, James is a huge cog in, in, in the Nolan operation, like, you know, um, they used to, and, you know, used to work there, you know, uh, right out there and they used to go to Bree Hill and it was, you know, it was just a great, you know, it was a great, it was a great atmosphere as well and, you know, we had great crack and um, I was, uh, you know, riding, it was luckily they came across a few good horses and the first one was probably say again, um, he, he won the Galway hurdle and then he went on to win a great one in uh, Punchestown, the Sorestown Cup. Um, so, and then uh, not long after him, Clune River, which, you know, he won big races on the flat. He won the Galway Hurdle. Um, he won, you know, he won numerous races as well. Um, and a French Accord, a French Accordion and a Cardin Atua, like, you know, um, Cardin Atua, he won a great one in Punchestown as well, the Sorestown Cup as well. And Kill Devil Hill then as well for Gickenstown. I won, won a great one in Fairy House on him. Um, and that led to, uh, I got a few outside rides then, you know, I, I was always, like, from the point to point season, trying to organise your own rides, trying to keep people happy, trying to always be trying to get on the best horse you can get on, but try not to annoy people by getting off their horses as well. Um, like, you can only ride one horse in a race and, you know, so you're trying to do the best for yourself and yet you're trying to, you know, try not to annoy people either. Um, so the point points were great for that, like trying to organize rides. So used to always trying to, even though I had an agent back at the time, uh, John Short, um, you know, I used to always try and organize my own rides as well. And then give him a ring and say, here, I have such and such, what have you got? And he'd say, he's got such and such. So we worked well, well together, you know, um, John, and he was, you know, he was after being shrewd as well. He gave me great advice when things wouldn't have been going well, like, cause no matter what you are, things, there's times things don't go well and don't go right and he'd be able to put a spin on it and, you know, you know realise that it's, it'll get better. Just keep your head down, keep grafting and keep working away. And so John, in fairness to him, he, was, he, was, he gave me great advice throughout the years, you know, and I was always, able, I was always had people that I was able to ring and say when things wouldn't be going well, if I'd done something wrong or, if, you know, um, Dennis Murphy was very good too. I often rang him and said, you know, I don't, you know, what do you think? And he'd say, he'd give me good advice as well, you know. When things got going as a professional, uh, you know, the money was, I had a few, few pounds and, you know, the Celtic Tiger was in. Um, so I bought a house and so actually Jamie Codd used to live with me back then. Um, so bought a house and this was probably when I think 2001, when uh, pounds became euros, that's when I bought the house, that's all I can remember. And so, you know, uh, we bought that in Carlo. So I was kind of living in Carlo. I was, uh, you know, going down to ride out in Nolans and I was, I was in Nolans maybe, I think three days a week. I was in Nolans five days a week and then I think Scobie, I used to go to Sean Tracy's to get Scobie off, so Scobie could go down to Nolan's to ride out. So uh, I dug him out of a hole again. Um, but so I used to go to Sean's, and do you know I actually rode a few winners for Sean's. I, I rode a, a winner in probably my first Galway ever winner uh, for Sean Tracy. Uh, Sean, uh, I can't think of the name of the horse now, but do you know. You know, Sean had loads of horses at the time. He's, you know, he'd loads of bumper winners, and you know, he, I used to ride, get a few rides off Sean for, you know, for going in, and you very rarely be going racing on your own. Um, you'd be either like meet up when I was an amateur. It was Scobie, Peter Fahey, um, uh, I know Kev, Kevin O'Ryan when he was in Willie's. Um, you know. Uh, then when I turned professional, then when I was living in Carlo, meet up with Tommy Tracy. Um, 
on occasion we'd go with Ruby when he was when I was kind of in Willies or Dunno, um the David Casey now and again, um I, who was always great crack was Mikey Fogarty. You'd be laughing the whole way to the races and the whole way home with Mikey Fogarty. Um uh, who else? We used to have loads. Uh, you know, whatever we always went racing, and whoever O'Shea Barry as well. You know, we'd always um, buy whoever had winners would buy chips on the way home. If we had a winner so on the way home, then the win who had the winner would have to buy the chips. Uh, Shea didn't like having winners. Well, he liked having winners, but didn't like having to buy the chips. Um, <laughs> I, I, there was one of the story we were in the chipper and uh, we're, I don't know one of the lads was getting a quarter pounder and your man says uh, did you want cheese on it or not cheese on it and the next thing Shea spotted it was I think it was 20 cent extra for cheese and your man uh, well, I think Tommy said yeah I'll have cheese no 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 he's, he's okay he doesn't want cheese on it he doesn't want cheese on it to save the 20 cent I never rode a winner at the Cheltenham Festival uh, I rode uh, I rode a winner on uh, according to Trois, uh, she two winners in Cheltenham in the, in, the, in the Christmas meeting one year after. One was a chase and the other one was a, a hurdle race. Um, actually, he, he was absolutely unbelievable the day he won the hurdle race. He was like an airplane. He was unbelievable. He never gave me his feel uh, of, of, he was just electric. Winged every hurdle in my hands, turned into the straight. They, I've never ridden probably he always, of the, all the horses I've ridden, that was the, one of the best feelings I've probably ever really got over hurdles was him right that day. He was electric. Um, and then he won the following year, then he won uh, uh, a chase in, in Cheltenham, uh, obviously not at the festival, but at the, the opening meeting, I think in December. Um, so I, I, I would have loved to say that I've ridden a winner at Cheltenham at the festival, but wasn't to be unlucky, I suppose. Um, I was supposed to ride uh, for Philip Rothwell. Um, native, I think it was native, uh, native, not native. I can't think of the name of him now. Um, he, I ended up dislocating my shoulder, and it was actually Russell's first Cheltenham winner instead of my first Cheltenham winner. But maybe I might have won on him. But you know, that's just the, the way the cookie crumbles. There's no point in uh, crying about it, whinging about it. That's just the way. That's the the sport we're in. Um, I started riding for Oliver Brady. Um, kind of, I suppose, 2003 or four. Uh, rode Balapur a couple of times for him, and then I rode for him for a good few years. And one of the sickening things uh, was Ebedain in uh, Cheltenham in the Triumph Hurdle. Um, he ran out at the second last. Um, they're not. Uh, not saying I would have won or anything like that, but he was probably going as it's a long, long way away. So you know, I don't, I don't think that I, I would have won, but um, he was going as well as he ever went at that stage of a race. But uh, that's that's in the the history books now, anyway. You know, but uh, I would have loved to ridden a winner for Oliver because he was a great character, and you know, he was he was just you know behind all the the you know the the crack uh, when he'd have a winner, you know, he was a great man to have a chat to. And, you know, we'd have great chats in the mornings. I used to go up and ride out for him, uh, especially tr to try and organise when I'd be going out to ride out for lads that, especially if they're far away, that I'd be going the direction that there's racing. So if there's racing up the north and I was going, I'd go to Monaghan and I'd ride out for Oliver on the way. And so, but then the biggest problem was you'd be you'd go in then for breakfast and, then he'd be chatting and you might have a couple of pounds to lose and you're thinking, oh, I, I, I kind of have to go, but you're, I can't say, you know, so trying to get away, he'd be just chatting and chatting and chatting and, you know, uh, he was a great character, but, you know, he was actually very good to me as well. You know, he used to, you know, look after, he'd stand by you. He was very loyal to me, you know, um, so I was very lucky to, to, to ride for him and he was a great character and, you know, it's just a, it's a pity we didn't have him around for longer. I prefer chases, you know, um, I, you know, uh, like, I always wanted to be jumped, you know, jump, it's all about the jumping. Um, like, I really, you know, on occasions, you know, lately at the races, because of the sun, a lot of fences will be taken out. But for me, I would have preferred them to be in when I would be riding because 
the chances are I probably wouldn't be on the better horse. So if there's no jumps, the better horse is probably going to run. So win. So I would have tried to keep as many jumps in as I can to try and make as many lengths as I can. So if I can make a length at this jump means that I don't have to make a length on the flat. So I used to love jump, the jumping, was, the chasing was the, was the one for me. Like I always preferred, you know, sometimes I'd even working at the races now and sometimes I, I might, you know, get the bugs. Just I wouldn't mind going out on one just to see if I still have it or not. But that's never going to happen anyway. I had great looking leopards down. Um, you know, I like I two grade ones and one at Pally Power and Leopard Stone. Uh, um, it was you know my first winner was in Leopard Stone. Um, you know, I just thought it was like you know you turn down the back in Leopard Stone and like there's just a line of you know lovely. They're really well presented fences, and they're good size. Um, you know, it's just. And generally, the best horse wins. You know, there's no real hard luck stories. It's wide, it's open. You know, the best horse nearly win, nearly always wins. Um, so, you know, Leopardstown is is a great. It's probably one of the best tracks in the world, really, to be honest with you. So, uh, Black Appalachia, I suppose, was he was in the Leopardstown in the the Paddy Power in Leopardstown, and he had ten five, which had been a bit light for me, and. I was we were I was in the race course uh, with uh, Anne Marie and they were having Christmas dinner. So while they were eating the dinner, I was out running the track. So needless to say, um, you know we thought he, like I thought he had a chance, but you know I didn't think he'd prob- probably necessarily win. But he was a good price. So Anne Marie and the sisters and all they ended up putting a few pound on him just because of the fact like that. He was light and I was doing light on him and uh, he ended up winning. So they all ended up buying coats, expensive coats anyway. So they were called Black Appalachian coats. Weight is a problem, uh, was a problem when I was a jockey. Um, I, I probably had a sweet tooth, which probably didn't go, you know, wouldn't be ideal, like really to be. Uh, but uh, I did have issues with it. Um, I was... Very lucky, uh, the, I can't remember who rang me, but somebody rang me from HRI saying that uh, there was a program on RTE at the time called The Health Squad, and they'd done a series on me, and I actually learned an awful lot about diet and about uh, what I should be eating and what I shouldn't be eating, and whereas what I would have been doing, I would have been probably starving myself and then binging on food and then starve myself and then you know binging whereas when i done this health squad and i learned more about food I mean, you can actually eat food what instead of cutting out stuff i was saying what can i replace a chocolate bar with i could replace it with something healthier so you're you can be eating way more bulky uh, of food like and yet be losing weight whereas before i might not have breakfast might have a cup of tea and maybe a purple snack on the way to the races and not eat maybe have a sweat at the races and then not and then on the way home have a chipper so it was really kind of not you know you, you couldn't sustain it so when i actually had this health squad i was actually having a proper healthy eating program rather than a diet and i was kind of around the 10 10 10 12 mark comfortably um so luckily that you know i don't like i really needed that to kind of open my eyes to see what you could eat and what you can't eat and you know the difference between even you know prepare how it's prepared whether it's uh grilled or fried makes a huge difference you know obviously if you're only having one now and again it's not the end of the world but um you know it definitely got me further got me a few more years longer out of my career because I couldn't keep doing what I was doing because it just, it just it couldn't be sustained because it just, you know, you know, I was fluctuating, my weight was fluctuating, I was sweating, I was running and uh, just couldn't keep going, you know. I've lost 10 to 11 pounds in, in a day before to ride a horse. So uh, actually Ken Whelan and um, Amory was coming, coming racing with me. So I rang Amory, I said, whatever you have on you, says you may take it off she says what do you mean i says 
I said, I just whatever you have on you, I said, you may take it off because I have to sweat in the car on the way down. So Amory had never experienced this before. So um, Ken was in the front and Amory was in the back, obviously because, you know, and uh, so the heaters were on. It was a summer's day. The, it was probably 30 to 40 degrees in the car. I had a sweatsuit on with the hat and the, all the gear. And then Marine was in the back dying, not only a bra on her. Um, so it was uh, a, an eye opener. And then, of course, halfway down, Ken lit up a cigarette to have a smoke on the way down. And that nearly put her over the edge altogether. Um, but uh, no, it, I suppose the song is. I don't know, uh, like obviously they've got, a, uh, a, they've got an extra pound for it, but um, it probably does make them make jockeys look after their diet a bit better. It's, if I had time to go again, I'd probably, the diet is more important than anything, I suppose. Um, would it been for me, like there is still lads, like, if I was writing now, I would probably have to have, if I was writing this evening, I would probably have to have a sweat in the bath here, if there's no sun at the races. I'd probably have to have a sweat in the bath here. If I had more to lose, I might have to put on the sweatsuit and go for a run and then sweat in the car on the way to the races. And then hopefully I'm there uh, when I get there. Um, so generally, if the sauna was there, I could take the chance that I've only... I could go and lose three pounds at the races and not worry about it and not be dehydrated as long. But um, the, I suppose the diet is the big thing. You know, if I had a, been more probably educated about the diet, um, and I switch to more, not call it a diet, call it a healthy eating program, eating food that you can eat without putting fat on you. Um, you know, it's, it's more about... If I was around now, I'd still... I'd still manage because you can't make excuses. You're either going to, you either want to be a jockey or you don't. If you don't want to be a jockey, you know, don't do it. But if you want to be a jockey, you have to look after your weight. And, you know, I did what I, you know, I suppose what I started off doing, what everybody was doing at the time. But uh, I suppose we weren't, there was none of us educated about it. As regards fitness level or making you a better rider, I don't think the gym, the gym wouldn't do anything for me as regards make, improving your riding ability. It would probably help you burn off a bit of fat, all right, uh, exercise, uh, providing that you're doing the right things and you're, you know, you're doing it right. Um, as regards making you, you know, like a better rider, no, I don't think so because I, I think once you're race riding and you're fit and you're, you know, uh, you're race riding, you know, it's, it's not... I suppose it's not that physically demanding that, um, you know, on the flat you have 50 year old jockeys, um, you know, able to ride uh, very well, uh, as good as a 20 year old is, you know, and they're, they're physically different people, they're f physically different strengths, but um, it's not, the, it's more about the, not about the physicality, there is a certain amount of physicality in it, but it's, it's not as if you have to li lift, uh, 200 kilos over your head or anything you know it's it's more about technique and you know i suppose using your brain listening to the horse uh, making, that, making sure that the horse is traveling within himself having been in the right position at the right time um uh, you know obviously you try being you're not always going to be in the right position at the right time uh, everybody can't be in the one position so you kind of have to ride the race you're given and it's more about that than uh, i don't think the, the gym is not making this, this uh, generation of jockeys any better than last year's generation of jockeys, I don't think, anyway. Freelancing then, kind of, you know, when I was, I probably finished up in Nolan's 2000, maybe six or seven, I'd say. I'm you know, not 100% sure now, but, uh, you know, even though, like, like everywhere I finished up, like, I, I still rode for everybody after. Like, you know, uh, you know just, like, it is important, you know, to, to, to leave uh, on as good a terms as you can leave, no matter where you're leaving. Um, like, I rode for Willie after, I rode for Michael Howrigan after I left him, I rode for Sue Bramall after I left her. Do you know, it's, it, I think, do you know, it's, it is important to kind of, do you know, whatever you're doing, try to do it, do you know, as well as you can do it, like, do you know. Um, so I was kind of freelancing then, and I, I kind of, actually, I, I ended up riding for Oliver McKeon, and uh, I rode Follow the Plan in, Le in 
Leopardstown, a Christmas uh, erotic web runner for him. And, you know, I was riding, I was kind of all over the country. I, I was riding for Tom Hogan, um, Oliver Brady. Um, just, I was, you know, I was trying, you know, uh, David O'Brien. Um, um, who else? I wrote for just so many I wrote for. I can't remember them all, you know. Um, I tell you, good, another good support for me was Val O'Brien. Like, I wrote for him for, for years, like, you know. Um, uh, so even though I actually was never in Val's place, but um, I never rode out for him, but I used to ride loads of horses, and he was very, very good to me. And I, you know, um, so I always, I suppose, I always tried to give every horse I rode the best ride I, I could give it. Um, obviously, like, everybody gives the horses bad rides. Um, you know, like no one knows quicker than ourselves when we give one a bad ride but you know we don't intentionally go out to give anything a bad ride you know i always give we we'll go out do your best and you know whatever happens happens um to no point worrying about it i dislocated my shoulder um which is probably still a bit you know dodgy enough like well it's not dodgy but it's just i don't have the same strength in it um and i broke my neck um you know look like lo loads of soft tissue damage, you know, that probably doesn't really count, you know, as regards brakes or anything. But like there was times you'd be riding and you couldn't lift your hands over your shoulders, you know. Um, but yet in the riding position, it, it, was, it was grand. Like you'd be in your position, you were fine. But like if you were to stand and put your hand over your head, you'd probably struggle to do it. Um, so um, like there was one, one time I, uh, I was riding for Pat Hughes, uh, Billy the Snake in Leopardstown. And uh, I had got a fall the day before. So I kind of, I had done it point to point and I dislocated my AC joint. So I had kind of done it the day before. So uh, luckily I gave uh, Michael O'Doherty a ring. And it was a Saturday evening. Leopardstown was the next day on a Sunday. Said that I was after doing my AC joint again. And so he said, come down and he'd strap it up for me. So I strapped it up and... Uh, I ended up uh, riding uh, Billy the Snake, a winner the next day, and it was probably, it's kind of one of the ones that stand out. I actually gave a good ride to you know that I felt like, you know, that I couldn't have been any better on it. Um, but um, sure, I suppose if I had fell off him, I would have said it probably was, uh, I shouldn't have rode him at all. But, you know, yeah, you kind of, you do take a chance. I suppose probably one, one of my biggest faults was maybe probably, probably push myself to ride maybe when I shouldn't have rode maybe um, but uh, look I, I, thank, I think I got away with more, a lot of it anyway thank God I got an opportunity to train horses uh, a friend of mine gave me he said he had a few horses and he asked he said he was he was going moving them and he asked me would I be interested and I said ah, geez, I don't know I don't think so he said well they're going move them now if you're thinking of it now is the time so I kind of said you know, maybe I will. So I ended up getting the, you know, the trainer's license and kind of, it's kind of, I was kind of getting in my late thirties and it was kind of drying up a little bit. It was getting things, you know, waves getting a little bit harder because rides were getting harder to get. So when the rides are harder to get, you're kind of, you're not probably watching your weight as well as you should do. Um, so then I kind of, so I started training and I was kind of training and I was still riding for a few lads and. I was still riding my own and so then I kind of uh, just said, I, I actually, I remember I was riding um, for Tony Black in Galway, what's her name, um, Fanna Dancer was her name and I had, actually she was my last winner a couple of weeks previous and I was riding her in Galway and at 10.13, I think it was 10.13 or a 10 11 show 13 and uh, anyway i was two pound over the weight and paul quish was i didn't know didn't really know who paul quish was at the time until i started working for hours but then i was in the i was in the saw uh, i was in the sauna and I, oh i it was uh, saying it was going to be two pound over and he announced it twice so i was in the sauna and uh, you know I said, you know, there was no need to announce it twice. As I heard it once, once is enough to announce it was going to be two pound over. So I kind of just, I kind of was on my mind at the minute and I kind of decided, you know, something, and enough is enough. Like, you know, uh, the winners were scarce and I couldn't see where another one was coming. 
and the rides were scarce as well and if I suppose if I was to go back again I probably wouldn't have gone training at all at the time I would have waited to know I would have preferred to maybe give everything to the riding until I was finished but um you know dear that's under here and there now it's it's done and dusted but um look at all as I ever wanted to be was a jockey really you know a jockey was all as I wanted to be um so I was lucky to get a good few years out of it as well so um I got you know the good of 20 and early years out which is which is great and then relatively not too injured after it as well so I'm kind of in one piece enough my first winners were actually over in Cartmel um for Alan Gray um so we actually we weren't long after having the boys so the boys are only a couple of months old so we loaded uh, two horses uh Anne Marie uh the two boys into the box into the jeep and off we went over to Cartmel and uh luckily uh Gray Hessian won and the other lad uh, finished second uh so we had, a, you know, that wasn't long training at that time. And another good friend of mine, Jim Hogan, said he had a friend who had a mare and he was to, looking for somebody. So I said, I'd take her. And so at the time I was looking at her, Jesus, I said, here, we'll have a go and we'll see. She was small enough. And I said, we'll see if we can win an 80 to 95 uh, handicap hurdle with her. Uh, anyway, so we'll have a go. And so we was training her. As it turned out, it was Misty Lady. And... Um, so actually she, actually a very funny story about that. Uh, she was a first reserve, the first day she won, she was just handicapped over hurdles and her first, she was reserve in a uh, fairy house. And so I didn't get any call. Uh, I was riding in fairy house that day myself. So the next thing I'm on the way to fairy house and uh, I got a call saying that I could get in if I wanted to. So I said, how am I going to get this? So how am I going to? So I rang Ken. So Ken, I said, the Jeep was, was gone. I, I had no Jeep. So I rang Ken and he borrowed Pat Carey's Jeep. And so he came over and I told him to uh, put one of the ponies in the box with her as well because she wasn't a great traveler on her own. So he, he came over, got the colors, got the passport, loaded her up. Um, because it was it was kind of a late later on uh, in the day the race was on so he loaded her up and um he came on up anyway and uh so he came he came up and luckily you know he led her up and all and luckily she she won anyway and you know um so on the way home anyway so he was gone home i was writing later on after so he was gone home and we so next thing he rings me he says here, I'm pulled in on the motorway here. There's not a screed of a light or anything. The Jeep, the, the battery, the alternator went in the battery on the way home. So he was pulled in on the side of the motorway. Uh, we were nearly at Erlingford at this stage. So luckily I had a tow bar on my car. So we had to pull in on the side of the motorway, which probably I wouldn't recommend people do now, but uh, we could hardly see him on the side of the motor. The hazards were barely flashing. There was that little battery left in it. And he had the Jeep still running out, ticking over. And uh, so what we did was, well, the boys got out with their phones and start flashing down cars to slow them down. And uh, we unhooked one and hooked up the other. And we got the Jeep as far as Erlingford and I brought the, the, the mayor home the rest of the way. So, you know, it's how, how things turn out. And, you know, but just luckily we got away with it. And, you know, uh, as it turned out, Misty Lady, she ended up winning... Uh, she won over 130,000 in prize money after she won. She won over, she won grade, say grade B handicap hurdles over two and a half mile, over two mile, and she won a three mile one as well. So she was, she was very versatile and she was even, she, for a small little mare, she was even placed in a listed race. So, um, so I was kind of finishing up then in the train and I'd really only her left. And I was riding out in um, Pat Doyle's and then one morning I came out and listed the lady. She was just a bit lame, and it was probably the time of year where she could be covered. So we said, uh, you know, the best thing to do now is cover her. And like when I was first going racing, I was an amateur. So the biggest problem of an amateur is getting stuck in traffic on the way out of the races. Um, like 
that never happens anymore. Like, you know, there's, you know, very rarely that you'd be worried about getting stuck in traffic. Other than the big days, it's kind of like, I suppose there's a lot more races. There's, there's probably still only the same amount of people in the country that are interested in racing. But there's a lot of race meetings now. Like there's, there's nearly racing, every, even in the wintertime. There used to be only races maybe three days a week in January and February. Like, you know, but there's nearly, there's a lot more racing now. And I suppose maybe that's why people have, you know, probably not got sick of it, but probably don't come as often. Um, they're just, it's, what's probably, what's scarce is probably, uh, you know, fonder, you know. Um, it's, look at it, like you have to change with the times, I suppose. Um, it's probably, when I started, it was probably more fun. It's like everything, everything has got more serious. The, the fun has gone, probably gone out of, like, I suppose, even the, the probably GA, maybe the, the, the same fun is not there. Like, you know, they don't have the same banter. Um, like we used to go race, we used to have, I don't know, we used to have great crack, great banter, slag one other off. Um, I suppose the fact that there's no saunas in the way room anymore, like we used to go into it and we would have a chat uh, in the sun. Like it wasn't just for, we, it wasn't just for losing weight. We used to have chat and talk and, you know, slag one another off and, you know, um, I suppose kind of like a therapy session. Um, whether, you know, it's, it's supposed they miss, whether they miss out on that or I, I don't know because I suppose I'm not in there anymore. I don't know what kind of camaraderie there is. Um, I don't know, is there, maybe there is, maybe there is the same camaraderie, but back when we were there, we used to always go race, there'd be always three or four in the car together, we'd meet up and go home together, if somebody got a fall, you know, to be always somebody to go back to the to hospital, you know, you'd never be stuck for, like, you'd never, if you drove, there'd be always somebody to bring your car back, you know, you'd never be worried about, um, and like, even, you know, like to contact Anne Marie and let her let her know if 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 there was anything to know if I was grand or if I wasn't grand and you know it's uh or if you're a bit concussed you might they might ring Anne Marie to say here keep an eye on him or you know it's it's uh no maybe I don't know so I'm not there so I can't really say it's the same camaraderie there maybe it is maybe it isn't uh but we, when back when we were doing it we we had great crack and you know great friends um you know it's. I do miss it uh, now, even still. But you know, like, you no know, point in cringing about it. Like, you know, it's life. Life goes on. So I was doing a few courses. Um, you know, you know, a harsh nutrition course and um, a few other courses. That and Helen O'Sullivan. You know, she would have been kind of like a, a guidance counselor, I suppose, for the word for retired jockeys uh, or for you know, and she. She said, would I be interested in having a look at uh, Iris? They were looking for somebody to do the speakers at the start, somebody who knew what went on. And so I ended up, uh, yeah, I said I would. And I, so I went up and I, so I started working for Iris doing just the speakers at the starts for the, for the, for the starter. So the stewards could hear and the jockeys could hear them. And so I started off working for them and I kind of, look at it, the training really wasn't for me. Uh, I kind of, didn't really want to be a trainer and so I kind of knew that there wouldn't be enough days for the starter system wouldn't be enough for a voyage so I kind of put in it I said to the to Declan uh Declan Huskins I said uh any chance you're here I'd show me how to work with the cameras and in fairness Iris is is it's a place where if you want to if you want to work if you want to learn how to things they they will throw you in that you know they'll just you know throw you into the deep end they'll they'll teach you you know if you want to learn how to these things work how cameras work and all that they just teach you so to start off on the parade ring camera and then they asked me would i be interested in going up on the heist i had a truck license at the time so i said should i have a go anyway and so i ended up getting the ticket for the heist and so kind of in fairness you know i've, I've lucky i've a very look it's it's a great job and you know i'm very lucky to have it and um so i'm, I'm very happy now at the minute to be honest with you very you know a great life um going racing um you know there's not like a good jumper like you know not like the feel of going down and one just you know coming out of your hands and 
you're never going to get that again like you know um you know i don't i don't un, like i don't understand well some people when they retire they're delighted i i'm happy where i am at the minute but i'm not saying i'm not but i still i, I just would like you know i i love doing what i was doing when i was doing it i do a bit of junior hurling at the minute <laughs> Uh, a junior, I call it junior F, but uh, junior, we have a junior C team now, which is which is more down my league than the junior B team. But um, like I do, I used to do a bit of golf and things like that. But when I was riding, but uh, it's hard to, to have with the kids and all that. It, it, golf is it, it's too it's too time consuming, really. Um, but uh, hurling, but, you know, a bit of uh, sure bringing the kids off uh, hunting and very small bit of show jumping uh pony clubbing uh just trying to keep myself kind of you know fit ish without um you know just do a small bit of jogging and running around the roads just to keep myself kind of half right um so just outside racing that's kind of it really you know i met Anne marie in um in liverpool um in uh 2004 I think it was and I don't you know it was in the Delphi in Liverpool and we were met, I was going in to meet Scobie and so little to say got chatting to Anne-Marie and she, she's uh, Anne-Marie would be a daughter of Pierce from Torres Race Course and of course she asked me what was my favourite track and I could Scobie was in the background shouting Torres Thurless. So I said Thurless anyway. So from when I said Thurless then sure it was like the best things in sliced pan and luckily um so that was so we started that was grand and so uh so we you know we ended up suppose uh I was I was like spirit the wild horse and I suppose she broke me as was the best, best way to describe it. And uh so so we ended up getting married then and uh we got married in 2008 i think it was um uh, i suppose i shouldn't say i think it was but yeah um but uh no uh like and like pierce and rena like and the whole family like they were from the day one they were they were always very welcoming and you know um you know i was like you know i even wrote um a winner a winner for pierce which is great like you know um it's uh just it, like they're just a great family and i was you know delighted to be to be part of it now as well and so we got married and um so sort of the boys were born in uh the boys were born in 2011 and we lucky they you know we had little bit of problems with the with the pregnancy and everything went well and the you know um they're great and then kitty came on she's she's back in back in 2018 and so she's great you know she's great crack and we're all great crack and we have great fun and we now with the boys the boys are mad for ponies hurling football soccer um we go try and go hunting every sunday with them um they they're they just they're have they're, i'm hoping they're having the best life ever and you know they're having great you know they're, they're having great time they've got great friends from the pony club and from the hunting and you know they're, they're it's 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 good the really the horses are great for for friendships and you know you meet a lot of good people throughout it like you know it's um they have their between hurling and football we don't have a free day you know it's great